So let's move into the second of our substantive sessions. Um, we decided that the second session should be devoted to a stratigraphy of Mike Smith. Now, as you can see, our knowledge of archaeology has rubbed off on us, and that now we can use the word stratigraphy really quite uh, freely without really knowing exactly what it means. But we gather it means to understand the layers of Mike's career. And in order to um, um, investigate these careers, we invited our long-term colleague and a, and a dear friend of the museum, Dr. Philip Jones, the distinguished curator of the, museum, the South Australian Museum, who will lead a panel which discusses a stratigraphy of an archaeologist looking at layers of Mike's work. So thank you, Philip Jones and friends. Over to you. Uh, yes, it really is a, uh, a daunting list. I, I had a look at the, the download of uh, participants here today and what a kaleidoscope of uh, talent and, and history in, in the audience as well as along here to my right uh, and uh, with the exception of Douglas Malta who can't be here uh, today and would have probably given us a, a dimension that I, I think we're, we're all very aware of in terms of uh, Aboriginal involvement in all of Mike's uh, activities. Uh, my own um, contact with Mike, I suppose we, we, we describe orbits in, in museums around each other's collections in a way, uh, and those orbits take us interstate and overseas. Uh, in, in Mike's case, they take us deep underground. I guess. Uh, but in his case, he, his and mine did intersect at one point, uh, mine at the level of history, uh, and his in the realm of history as an extension of the sort of archaeology that he practices uh, in looking at a red ochre and its uh, circulation through Aboriginal Australia and particularly uh, from a couple of sites in Central Australia. Kaku has, always, has already been mentioned as the source of the uh, Purichara ochre. Um, the word kaku was also used by the Flinders Rangers uh, Aboriginal people and the people visiting the, the mine in the Flinders Rangers called uh, Bukatu, uh, where Mike focused some of his research. And as he got deeper into this business of ochre provenancing, I found that the conversations I was having with Mike were, were um, of a nature that I think he, he has with many people. He has very few wasted conversations. Uh, they're all focused, I, th I think, um, whether they're on the um, subject of, of history, desserts possibly, uh, archaeology or, or any of the arcane elements of, of archaeology that we've touched on today. And I realised, uh, as my conversations with Mike developed, uh, that none of it was small talk. It was, well, it might have been on my part, but it, it was being siphoned off into this, into this well that he would then draw on for his publications. Um, and not only his publications, because the other uh, orbit that intersected was the orbit of uh, museology and museum ethnography. Uh, there are fewer of us speaking that language uh, today, I think. The, 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 f the field is in some degree of crisis, I, I think. And, and Mike has been one of those who, who has recognised the importance of tethering archaeology to museums because it is very often, apart from the sort of public archaeology, the TV archaeology that we've come to, to um, uh, that we've become familiar with in the last 15 or 20 years, it's been the museums which have introduced archaeology into the popular imagination from the very first uh, breakthroughs that Tyndale made in 29 and John Mulvaney uh, following. Uh, the actual evidence and the, the, the material and the artefacts have been uh, tangibly presented in, in museums. And this, of course, is something that we'll be exploring this afternoon through the um, museum segment. But anyway, uh, those, um, those orbits, 
I, I think uh, partly what we're looking at uh, in this session, we're, we're looking at stratigraphy, just as we, we really did in the last session as well, uh, the stratigraphy of an archaeologist. And if you turn to my recipe uh, for a stratigraphic uh, layer cake in the dessert book, you'll, you'll see that I, I, I tried to tackle that uh, there. But I'm not an archaeologist, so it's a very, um, it's a dodgy recipe, I think. <laughs> <coughs> but anyway, Anne... Uh, has been in the deepest layers of Mike's stratigraphy because she was a fellow student with him here at ANU in, in the early 70s uh, and came to, to know Manic soon after that as well. And uh, her own interests, have, her own orbits, I suppose, have, have coincided as well through the provenancing of stone material, uh, ochre, uh, as well, even though Anne's work has taken her uh, out, of, uh, out of that realm, perhaps into historical archaeology and her work in Antarctica and uh, other historical sites, uh, both in Australia and New Zealand and Jordan and France and all over the place, in, in a way mirrors the eclectic, um, extraordinary range of Mike's interests. So I'd like to uh, pass over to Anne. Um, being a um, geoscientist, um, as well as an archaeologist, I've decided I'd like to step back from the stratigraphic profile briefly before I start on the lowest layers and interpreting them and have a look at the stratigraphy as a whole. And um, I guess this has sort of come out of when um, this Mike Fest was announced. I sat back and thought, hmm, Mike's a really great friend. I'd love to do this today. He's a good archaeologist, but is he that good to have a whole day to himself? And I sat back and reflected on it, and I thought, yes, he is. And <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm still here. <laughs> um, I sat back and thought about what are the qualities, what are the hallmarks of Mike's approach to archaeology? What are the qualities that he's put into his archaeology that makes him a good archaeologist? And have allowed him to achieve so much. What I'm just going to do is run through some words. Um, I think that um, probably, and some of these um, words I'm using here, I want to sort of refer back to, or um, if you remember them, you'll pick them up in my descriptions of the lower layers of the stratigraphy. So I think one of the hallmarks of Mike's work is his thoroughness um, and his uh, methodical approach to things. A very traditional sort of approach, but on top of that, he's built a lot of other things. Um, he's um, very, in a scientific sense, inclusive and multidisciplinary. So he has brought to his work, and I think he's gathered in, over the accumulated years, he's gathered in more and more different approaches. He's um, built a foundation and then added more to it and woven them together to produce um, a rich story about um, sites and landscapes. Um, on a personal level, he's also very um, inclusive and collaborative. Um, and at all different levels, it's sort of egalitarian, I think, in that he will deal with colleagues, um, senior lecturers, um, important people, and students all on very much the same level, treats them equally. He's interested in what they have to say. You don't have to agree with him, but he's interested to know your thoughts. And he is also reflective because he thinks about what people say and where he feels it's appropriate, he draws it into his work. And I think this has also made his work much richer. Um, I think the other, one of the other key hallmarks is his focused nature. He hasn't done anything too tangential. He's moved forwards, in the words of uh, Prime Minister Julia Gillard, but in a very productive direction. Um, I think he's also very intelligent and reflective about his work, and I'm beginning to realise he has a prodigious memory. Um, I think the other key thing, which um, Philip has alluded to, he wastes nothing. So I suspect despite his immigration from England, he may have um, strong Scottish genes. Um, I think in terms of wasting nothing, I think what Mike has done is every opportunity that has presented itself, he's taken. Um, he's not been daunted by challenges. Um, and in his interactions with people, he also has wasted, as Philip says, nothing. He, he, he learns from people. He doesn't take from people. He absorbs what people are prepared to give. Um, and it engenders a very um, 
good friendships, good collaborative work. Um, and I, uh, in talking about the layers, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, I think also um, that, um, to paraphrase a quotation, beside ev most good men, there is a very good woman. And in this case, Mike and Manik, um, I think, sort of got together in 74, 1974 at some stage. And Manik has been a hugely supportive and interested um, part of his life and part of his research and obviously his personal life. Um, Manik has gone on digs when she wanted to. She's not gone on work when she didn't want to. She's a very strong woman in her own right, very intelligent, very creative, and has some very strong egalitarian views that I think has helped to keep Mike honest, balanced, and enabled him to wear the same size Dekubra for most of his career. <laughs> My other one comment as backgrounding is that in putting all these things together and looking at Mike's work over his lifetime, I think what Mike also is, he's a builder. He started small with very um, well-developed foundations and he's built block by block. So he started with um, work at Runka as a volunteer. He went to ANU and studied to become an archaeologist. He did his honours at Devon Downs. He then did, uh, um, which was an excavation, then a survey, um, Plumbago Station, and he's slowly been building. And you can see these foundations, and then he's pulled in the multidisciplinary stuff. And he's excavated Purutjara, so really pulling all this stuff into one site. He has then looked outwards and he has attempted to put Purutjara into its Central Australian chronological human and landscape context. And then, when it, at the museum, he's branched out further and so you can see like a trunk of a tree with the early roots, this trunk that happened in Central Australia from the museum. He's sort of the branches have, have um, grown outwards to create a fantastic shade. And that's sort of looking globally to see how, what are the, the archaeology of deserts around the world. And I think this is an extraordinarily um, beautiful edifice that Mike has built. It enriches our lives and I think it is also so well built that it will stand for a long time. Um, so that's, that's the preparatory bit. Now I'll try and skip through the lower layers. <laughs> so um, I couldn't find the sterile soil because I understand from Mike, I think when I was at Ronka with Mike on an excavation in 73 and I believe at that time Mike said he had wanted to be an archaeologist from when he was, I thought three, but he wouldn't have even known the word then. So I think it was sort of like, you know, five, six, seven or what have you. But I was impressed at the time because I'd never known anyone who knew what they wanted to be so young in life and actually did it. And I guess this is part of the plan. So I guess I'm calling the base, that the basal layer when he understood he wanted to be an archaeologist. It's a thin layer, but important. And layer basal minus one is Runka. So <coughs> my understanding from Mike is that um, he'd been trying to find ways to get involved in archaeology. He um, talked to Doug Seaton at the University of Adelaide, who suggested he join the Anthropological Society. And at the Anthropological Society, one time, Graham Pretty, who was then curator of archaeology at the um, Adelaide Museum, South Australia Museum, gave a talk on his work at Runka and Mike asked if he could join. And Graham was very inclusive and welcomed um, all the help he could get and invited Mike along. Now, for those of you who don't know about Runka, Runka is a um, quite important site on the um, Murray River, um, which Graham pretty excavated from 1968 to 1974 and Mike was involved in this excavation for two years of his life. Um, not having a lot of money, the South Australian Museum had to rely on a lot of volunteers um, and those volunteers worked extremely hard. They, Graham and others, trained them. Um, they worked every second weekend, I understand, and on Wednesday nights they sorted the and catalogued material from the excavation. So this was the foundation of Mike's archaeology in a way and I... From my two weeks at Runka, I found it um, to be a great training exercise. It was a tightly run excavation. Graham was very inclusive. He treated people equally. He taught well. Um, and it was a fantastic learning experience. Um, and so I think some of the hallmarks of Mike that I have noted are in fact things that he may have learnt from Graham. Um, I'm just going to read a short bit out of um, Karen Walsh's book on Runka, pulling all the work that was carried out there together, because it mentions Mike. 
A notable new recruit was young Mike. Aged about 16, Mike was quietly determined to become an archaeologist. He had read everything he could lay his hands on dealing with the subject and was most disappointed to find that igno ex ignorance of our existence had made him miss three years of practice, practical experience. Making the most of his opportunities now, however, he was to be found on the edge of every interesting conversation, soaking up information like a sponge. Ah, a repeating theme here. On the site, he was a patient and diligent worker who did whatever job he was given without complaint. A certain dry humour and a propensity for evil suggestions made him a welcome member of the team. For those like Mike with a real taste for archaeology, we had a number of things on the site to interest them. Um, and the site was actually an extremely rich site. Um, it, it, they excavated nearly 200 burials lot of, with, with grave goods and things like that. And I would just like to say that this excavation of burials was in fact a salvage excavation rather than a purely research excavation. Um, was quite interesting in itself for the time. Um, my experience at Runka was I found Mike very welcoming. He showed me around the site, um, taught me what I needed to know and was just generally very friendly. So much so that by the, um, uh, I had sort of by the end of the dig I decided I wanted to be an archaeologist too. Went back to West Australia and did what I had to do but because I couldn't do a degree there I had to go to ANU to become a proper archaeologist. Um, and I met Mike there in 1975 when he had one year there. But before I go on to the next upper layer, I just want to mention that in terms of Mike trying to um, make the most of the opportunities that offered or even seeking out opportunities, um, he also had done a lot of other excavations before he went to ANU. So um, just some of those were some of the key ones. Um, he dug at Canalda Cave on the Nullarbor in two seasons with um, Dr Gallus. Um, that was in 1971 and 1973. I should say that um, in 1973... I dug in 1973. So when he started in 1971, he was 15 years of age. So pursuing his career at an early age. Um, he dug at Wiry Bog in South Australia with Roger Lubers and he also got involved in caving and did a lot of um, some excavations of faunal material and cave surveys. So you can see how all this background is slowly building into perhaps Port Jara and um, desert archaeology. Not in the desert but on the fringes. Layer, basal layer minus three, a student at ANU. Um, <sighs> Being a student at ANU at that time was also, um, it was an important period to be there and I think it also um, moulded who we were going to be as archaeologists and archaeologists and it moulded Mike in particular. Um, it was a, as, Ma as John Mulvaney has said, it was a new department. Um, there were a lot of um, fantastic um, new enthusiastic teachers. There was the research school of um, uh, the Research School of Pacific Studies with a lot of other well-known archaeologists um, and as Mike has also said, he was among giants and there was a lot to learn. Um, and they were doing a lot of interesting research and um, Mike was one of the few who regularly attended the um, seminars down at the research school um, in his um, bare feet and duffel coat. He was noticed. He also, he, he in terms of wasting nothing, he's also not ostentation. Ostentation is not given to lots of... Um, uh, surplus stuff and when I first met him he was living in Corrin Huts at ANU which was the huts moved down from the mountain after building Corrin Dam which was fairly Spartan and people who lived there had quite a reputation for toughness. So I think you know Michael actually Mike probably could have been a good archaeologist anywhere including in Antarctica after that experience. Um, so it was a really amazing time to be there. Um, staff were John Mulvaney, Isabel McBride, Andre, Andre Rosenfeld, William Shaw Cross. And in a recent conversation with Mike, he said to me that William Shaw Cross was particularly important to him um, as an undergraduate because Wilfred, with his inquiring mind, encouraged Mike to understand that you just didn't have to accept what you were told. Um, there was not only one way of looking at stuff and you could question the science, you could question the data, you could reinvestigate and re-explore um, material, look at things in different ways and, and this is very much what he did with his honours thesis um, at Devon Downs, which interestingly enough brought him back very close to Runka. Um, I think that's pretty much... What I was going to say, what I, I just had one anecdote which just shows how focused and committed Mike was to archaeology, which is at some stage in the um, three or four years that um, 
Mike and Monica and I all lived in the same street in Canberra. We were invited to a dinner party with um, just archaeological students and we were served Murray Cod. This could have been the Devon Down years, actually. Um, and we were given jam jars, empty jam jars, and we were told we had to put all the bones, including the otoliths, in the jam jars. And we would be in deep trouble if any went missing because he was very keen to know how bone weights related to meat weights of fish. So another example of Mike not letting an opportunity go wasted. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Anne. Fantastic, and uh, building up this um, stratigraphy now, uh, and also I, I think that that listing. We've had a couple of analogies: the surgery and uh, analogy, the cricket analogy, but the listing of all of the key and major archaeological digs that Mike has participated in uh, during the last thirty. 30 years r reminds me also of the military analogy, not through necessarily his organisation, but just that a mental image flashed into my mind of, of a general with all that fruit salad on the lapel, you know, uh, Devil's Lair, uh, Runka, Wiry Swamp, you know. It, it's impressive. I, I can see maybe another, another picture at some stage. Uh, I did have a list of the excavations he went on as a volunteer at, at ANU, which reads, um, Lake Mungo twice with John Mulvaney and Wilfred Shaw Cross, Cave Bay Cave with Sandra Bowdler in Tasmania, Early Man Rock Shelter with Andre Rosenfeld, Native Well with Mike Morwood, um, Cathedral Cave with John Beaton um, and I went on a survey with him at Prungle and I just, I did want to actually mention the Cathedral Cave excavation because Mike is also, but it's very secret knowledge, slightly romantic and it was in Cathedral Cave that he proposed to Marnik. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Well, someone who, who's almost had a, I suppose, a parallel career in some ways is... is uh, the current Winthrop Professor of Archaeology at the University of Western Australia, uh, Peter Veth, who, who will, I think, throw some very interesting light on uh, Mike's modelling and, and, and way of thinking about the desert and how those paradigms have shifted over time. Thank you. It's uh, very exciting to be here. I feel like I've been living a Mike Fest for the last 30 years. Indeed, my first uh, transect through the cultures of the Walmajeri and Jaru people and by geographically down the Sturt Creek was to Lake Gregory in 1980. So that was with one of Binford's students as an undergraduate. I couldn't believe the dunes, the salt lakes, the, the, the strata that was horizontally splayed in front. Jump ahead 30 years, almost 30 years, and there we are on the invitation of Jim Bowler, uh, Kim Mohood and others and the traditional owners looking at this extraordinary site at Paruku, at Lake Gregory, Bungabidi. And we are looking for an earlier facies of occupation, possibly at 30, 40, possibly 50,000 years. So what was it, 10 days, two weeks of meticulous work of what were promising to be fluffy uh, lunettes, soft cake-like, thanks Jim, um, after numerous kanga hammers, uh, running generators and uh, sharpening devices and backhoes and spades for about a week or so, and finally getting in the uh, uh, late Gregory Mullen backhoe with the chairman actually running it, a huge trench exposed one of these earlier gravels. We um, found artefacts and OSL dating was carried out by Cat Fitzsimmons and others. And on the last half hour, I think on the very last day, with failing light, Mike was down the major trench, we'll call it super trench, and he just appeared and said, I have an artefact. And that turned out to be bracketed by dates conservatively coming in at OSL at 37 to 50,000 BP, but most likely between 45 to 50. So that's the sort of icing and, and basal chronology and strata you get in the cake that, that is the package with Mike. It's quite extraordinary. When I came back from that 1980 trip and started to read the Australianist literature seriously and read 
Jennings from the US, uh, Mountford, Gould, Hayden, Mulvaney and others in Australia. It was Mike's work coming out in the early 80s that actually had an incredibly fine-grained forensic approach to looking at the way the archaeology sat spatially, behaviourally, in a way which was almost uh, an interesting combination of processional and post-processional approaches that actually spoke to deep history. And, and it was that that inspired me, and Mike was actually writing explicitly about this, to think about desert mobility patterns that were extraordinary in the global level. They are of a scale that we hadn't thought about, I suspect, as Australian archaeologists, certainly not for the arid zone. People covering hundreds, if not thousands of kilometres in an annual round. To think about the nature of the essence of the desert adaptation, where people may have had and do have a very strong cultural law, but where their resilience allows enormous flexibility in not just social relations, but in their economies through time. And this is very much the desert narrative. People go into possibly more benign environments at 40 to 50,000 years ago. In some senses, the desert climatically comes to them and there are these desert transformations. And so these transformations are seen obviously in changing records from Lake Mungo, Willandra, from many projects including most seminally Purijara from Mike and increasingly from all these other excavations that he either worked in directly or indirectly throughout the arid zone. It's about transformation, it's about resilience, it's about flexibility but with this strong cultural law that has deep time. And I think um, Mike actually took one of Reese's core tenets about people being infinitely adaptable, able to move into any kind of environment, able to withstand most climatic extremes and, and push this agenda of 40,000 years of desert penetration, gave that flesh with the Purijara archaeological record and then argued quite strongly in many different ways that there was evidence for repeated occupation through the last glacial maximum albeit in different ways by desert peoples in different parts of the arid zone. And that was very much the dynamic. That was very much the discourse between his work, Peter Hiscox from Lawn Hill and other parts of southeast Australia, and my own predominantly in the western desert. And this has been borne out now in many, many exciting ways. So just think about it. This is, it is a major climatic change. There's a temperature drop of up to nine degrees. June fields are active. They're on the edge of Duntroon in Canberra. It's different to the Ice Age of the Northern Hemisphere, but human groups obviously did change their economic, social, and probably spiritual and belief systems very significantly. And Mike actually laid the architecture of understanding and engagement to deal with that very complex issue for arid zones, which then, in a sense, migrated from Australia to comparative understandings of the deserts of South Africa, of South America, and then, in a sense, go back into thinking about Eurasian glacial la landscapes of North hemisphere and in fact Clive Gamble has taken up many of these themes and said well we have these kind of aggregation nodes we have these LGM signals from the northern hemisphere the deserts play it out differently what are the comparisons what can they tell us about the way people make art what can it tell us about the way they exchange information we have Venus figurines in the north what do people do in the south maybe our Cape faces maybe not really, really important hot tubs of innovative thinking. And this came from work that was indeed surgical and forensic-like. That definitely is the trademark of Mike's approach. But it works hand in hand with extraordinary creativity, which is, I guess, why his work is a hub for all of these uh, creative artists in allied fields. You can't help but think about the way people moved between different water sources, how they signalled with art, where the ochres came from over vast distances when you look at the detailed record that is the Purijara story. In 1996, we were doing about the sixth survey for the Matu native title claim. Uh, these were technically the last people on the planet to make uh, contact with Europeans. A large group of people from 63, 1964, their art is outside here, perform exhibition. People like John Cardi and others are here who have worked on that intensively. And extraordinarily, the West Australian system required proof beyond reasonable doubt that the last people on the planet actually had some interest in native title. So we're on about our fourth major trip around the boundary of 130,000 square kilometre uh, potentially determination area. 
and Mike volunteered to come along. That's probably too soft a word. I think I cajoled him. He said, oh, would you like to come on a nice little trip? So <laughs> he arrived, and there were probably about 40 Mardu traditional owners, intergenerational participation, women, men. We had about eight vehicles, and we had to do a very, very large circumnavigation of the claim to look at the intersection between archaeology, occupation patterns, particularly contact sites and art and dreamings, or jukur, and then see how that might feed into the larger uh, anthropological and uh, claimant oral testimony. Mike very generously, uh, valorously agreed to drive the support vehicle. This was a tray back that probably had too much on it. I think it had roughly 800 litres of fuel, about 10 tyre casings, um, huge numbers of spares. He did have uh, two or three Madhu people accompany him on this trip. But it was about two and a half weeks of very, very serious driving over literally hundreds of sand dunes per day or two days. And during that time, we excavated the Galpi Rock Shelter, uh, which was a significant part of the determination. We recorded about 60 or 70 major sites around the edge of the determination. And ultimately, that report was handballed into the final uh, 2002 decision, which gave people exclusive possession. Now, that just wasn't a trip where Mike contributed substantively in the field. At the end of it, we produced um, a major peer-reviewed report, which was fantastic. It brought art models for changing um, seed grinding use and so forth, and indeed more uh, evidence for the way groups might have responded to peak aridity during the last glacial period together. Um, and so forth. But interestingly, Mike actually worked closely with one of the senior men who had been part of the Madhu movement for at least 15 years, a man called, and I could use his name now because of the period of time that's elapsed, Kiriwuri or Matt Gardner. Um, Kiriwuri had worked ex intensively with anthropologists, with historians, with mining folk, and indeed with archaeologists for some time in ways which presented unique cross-cultural understandings of how the Madhu experience immediately pre and post contact could inform archaeology to create envelopes of imagination about where people may have actually gone during, as a nephew, an initiatory cycle, where women may have gone uh, through the, the Wimper cycle and so forth on the Percival Lakes. This was incredibly, not just interesting information, but absolutely um, almost globally unique. And Mike um, uh, nominated or started the process for Matt Gardner to get an Order of Australia, which he did a couple of years later, and that was incredibly exciting. There were about a thousand Madhu people came to Newman to actually see Kiriuri receive his medal from uh, Governor Jeffries. In fact, he got it twice because someone lost it a year later. It was burnt in a campfire, and so they actually they awarded him another one, and another thousand people came back to Newman. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so probably not many people to get to nominate someone for an Order of Australia twice. And of course, we've already acknowledged the fact that Mike has received his own award very recently, and there's a lovely sense of, um, not closure, but uh, uh, the circle is closed in the sense with that incredibly generous um, action and what's just been recognised now as an extraordinary lifetime and dedication to desert archaeology. I have to say, at the end of that trip, Mike's eyes were pretty bloodshot. He was tired. We'd worked um, the usual sort of 12, 14-hour days, excavated, um, worked late into the night. And I remember on the second last night, he turned to me and said, um, yeah, it's not quite the same as Central Australia. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was hot. It was up around the 48, 50-degree mark. And uh, we didn't have many permanent waters that we were actually uh, coming to see in the Centralian sense of the word. Um, look. Deserts have been portrayed as hard landscapes. They're portrayed as extreme. And at one level, if you don't know what you're doing, that's correct. But I guess one of the things that we might share and other arid zone archaeologists or people who have worked in the arid zone, like Peter Hiscott, Sir Cother and others, is that they're soft places. If you work with the desert resources, with the desert cycles, and you're infinitely adaptable, for want of a better word, they are infinitely um, resource-rich areas. But they are hard tasks. And for those hard tasks, Mike was always there, whether it was the writing of Desert Peoples, which was the first archaeological synthesis of um, desert archaeologies uh, in the Southern Hemisphere and including Northern Hemisphere examples. Mike was there. He had the direct contacts into Chile, Argentina and so forth. And he got people to contribute fantastic papers in a way which probably no one else could. 
Um, I've already mentioned the fluffy lunettes of Lake Gregory when the hard work was there and we all worked hard getting many, many blisters. In fact, I have one picture of bandages on top of gloves and then with gaffer tape wrapped around them because there was nothing that could buffer us from the impact of digging through this concrete. Mike was there. Um, when it was decoding the megafaunal remains we found at the edge of Lake Gregory, Mike was there. It turned out to be a horse, but we didn't know that in the beginning. It was terribly exciting at the time. Our, our reference collection was a bit small. <laughs> um, yeah, so look, in the way that Kiriwiri or Matt Gardner clearly bridged the dream time, the jukur and the present, Mike Smith has given voice to that same transition through archaeological narratives and, of course, many other disciplines. And that's, I think, an incredible enduring legacy for the deserts, for desert peoples and for the wider community for us. So for all of those reasons, I say thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I think on all of the all of the returns and the rebounds and the forays that Mike has made to Central Australia, most of them anyway, uh, there's been one uh, constant referent, uh, a sounding board, a, a friend, uh, somebody uh, there in Alice Springs who can maybe in, in the meekest and mildest way that we've all come to, to appreciate, um, make the most... Uh, uh, confronting uh, task seem seem achievable and, and possible through through opening doors and uh, gentle hints. I'm talking, of course, of Dick Kimber, who uh, has, I think, been Dick and Marg uh, here today have been constant friends uh, for Mike and and Man Manic and supporters really for his archaeology in a way facilitating it. Uh, in, in a unique way. So I think, Dick, maybe you can give us a sense of that and a sense of uh, maybe also of the, the way in which Mike has conducted work with uh, desert people. I hope it's uh, understandable here. But also I was told uh, that I wasn't to prepare anything initially. So this is a bit... Uh, tricky on this. I thought I was going to get asked some questions, but we'll leave that for a while. Look, I'd like to say Mike, Marnik, Ben and Moshu, it's been fabulous to know and it's really a family show, not just Mike, I know uh, Marnik's got the ability to pin brick him a bit and uh, it's nice to have a good laugh with everyone. So thanks to the family. I'd like to say thanks to whoever's invited me here. It's really nice to be down here and uh, I'll I know I'm going to forget a fair bit, so I'll give it a go, though. I was thinking about a uh, lovely poem that Mark delivered first, fabulous poem, but uh, I was thinking another one was... I can't remember it exactly, but it's something like a very brief one. The loss was found and taken from the place uh, while the dingoes were howling and the crows were saying grace. And it uh, reminded me a little bit of... Mike, when he was out with Ben in the in the time out in the Stalecki Desert and uh, Ben got bushed a bit but he kept his calm and Mike had to panic a bit that day. But it was, uh, I suppose it's also happened to various other people who have been with me. They've been lucky to get through. But uh, the other thing I guess was uh, there's uh, someone, uh, who was it? Um, Philip mentioned about the army and the salad, but I was in national service and I remember joined the army we effed about by experts. So there's a slight difference you can get in all these layers, as we we're saying. But uh, I've uh, I have prepared a little bit here. I checked with Marnik that was okay. I think she got a bit of a doubt about it, but I'll just read it a little bit, please. Uh, my Marnik Ben Rosh have been good mates for over 30 years. The celebration of life, uh, Mike's life, there's also a celebration of theirs. Uh, I hope the following cameos derived from Mike's correspondence to the 1990s give some pleasure. Uh, this one, greetings from Tasmania. 
Finally, a non-archaeological holiday. Marnik and I have just finished 10 days of bushwalk in Tassie from Cradle Mountain to Lake St Clair. I'm now so trim that my jeans won't start, but we'll binge on fish and chips in Hobart, Hobart to avoid need to buy another pair. <laughs> that, was, that was 1991, early 91. Then speaking of a friend, Mike commented there was still a sense of the warm in the glow while herding the, bu herding the bullocks into the china shop. On a more cheerful note, I decided to confront another phobia, one that often gets me into strife with Marnik. I'm taking dancing lessons. <laughs> Seems that I'm a hopeless case. On the home front, all real here. Mosu says she has a, new, a boyfriend and they kiss at recess time. I tell you, Dick, I'm not ready for all this stuff. <laughs> ben has also settled into high school. You wouldn't believe how busy it has been since I got back from the course, uh, from the centre. I'm going to learn how to read and shower to get through the paperwork. This is 92. We've been trying to extract and identify any fats or other organic uh, substances in the oven stones. The aim is to see if we can identify what was cooked in the oven. The things are so sensitive we've had a few surprises and one of the oven stones block out sunscreen was identified. <laughs> uh, I'm having a small operation to correct orientation in my left eye. Sort of a wheel alignment. 15th of uh, February 1993. We've got no puppy snaps. Mum discovered all the photos that she took in the January, February came to naught. She had no film in the camera. All that badgering was sort of guessed the line of in front of miscellaneous Canberra monuments, but no film. <laughs> Suppose it's better to travel than arrive, etc. <laughs> ben is about to get braces, virtually a teenage fashion accessory in Canberra. <laughs> 29th of June, 94. I think I mentioned I've been invited to work on material from a, a Bronze Age site in central Cyprus. Finally, I'm here. Thanks to Golf Air, the trip from Sydney took an incredible two and a half days. Phineas Fogg and his balloon could have done better. <laughs> 28th of uh, May, 1996. As you know, I've resigned from the ANU, but hopefully not from archaeology or from academic life elsewhere. Having recklessly bowed out, I'm still wondering when my parachute is going to open. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, and this uh, this is a little bit. Uh, we're all glad the the parachute did arrive, but uh, while it, that concludes a little cameo from the nineteen nineties, you know, may not be aware that today the prime minister, the right honourable. Miss Julie Gillard, Gillard announced a sensational new discovery by Mike. She had to elbow opposition leader Tony Abbott aside to make the announcement. But so significant was Mike's find that he could not resist also making a comment. Mike's notes for the Prime Minister's speech, already being hailed as equivalent to get his address, read as follows. I think Mike was very clever in writing these. We should all be proud of this. After having dug to a depth of 10 metres last year, British scientists found trace of copper wire dating back 200 years and came to the conclusion that their ancestors already had a telephone network more than 150 years ago. <laughs> Not to be outdone by the Brits, in the weeks that followed, an American archaeologist dug to a depth of 20 metres and shortly after a story was published in the New York Times, American archaeologists finding trace of 250-year-old copper wire have concluded their ancestors already had an advanced high-tech communication network 50 years earlier than the British. <laughs> Today, after a week's solid work by Dr Mike Smith and assistants, I am pleased to be able to report the following. After digging as deep as 30 metres beneath Old Parliament House, where an unusual constant stream of hot air was a significant problem <laughs> for the archaeological team, 
Dr. Smith reported that he'd found absolutely sweet F all. <laughs> it was therefore concluded that for 250 years ago, Australia had already gone wireless. Uh, after a comment, opposition leader, leader Tony Abbott added, just makes you proud to be an Australian, doesn't it? <laughs> now, I'm not sure how I'm going for time, but uh, just yeah. one comment I remember. Uh, there was uh, Giles mentioned about the meals out bush and uh, when... We started off with Mike. We had nice meals at his home with Marnik. I remember once saying something about the Aussie rules footy and someone had given him curry and she raised an eyebrow at that. But uh, nonetheless, we had good meals in town everywhere. And then out bush, uh, when I first started with Mike, we did little short trips out uh, where uh, we're following in the really... I'll go back a little bit. When, when I was 10, I tried to become an archaeologist I went down and met Herbert Hale at the South Sea Museum and he, uh, very kindly, we went into like going into a cave, dark cave, it was so the blinds all pulled down and my old mum had got dressed up in her best outfit and I went along with a little baso haircut and short trousers and that. And uh, he said, of course, you realise you'll have to go to Oxford or Cambridge. And I understood that was the other side of the moon. So that ended up, that was the last chance I had to be an archaeologist. I'm probably very grateful to the archaeological fraternity that I'm not. But uh, anyway, Mike and I, we went out to a place called Kyumba and uh, then various other sites around the Alice. We kept, Mike was looking for this Pleistocene potential, which uh, a bloke called Ron Lampert had got uh, down in the Flinders Ranges area. But we're trying to find somewhere like that, so... Mike kept suggesting where we, where we might find it. And there'd been Rhys Jones, uh, Graham Griffin, Peter Latz and myself in a car. I think it was driven by Paul Ulbricht, the missionary. But we're coming in from a conference uh, out at the CSIRO lab and uh, in Alice Springs. And we all said it's got to be the Valley of the Fink. Everyone agreed it had to be there. Well, Mike tried the Valley of the Fink and he didn't get these Pleistocene dates. So... We said, we'll try Lara Waters as a lovely place out on the Palmer. Again, even though the dates were good, the, the evidence was good, you're still not getting anywhere near this date. So uh, as a last throw of the dice, or a couple of last ones, I said, look, hell of a way out and it's hard to get to. Try the Tarn of Orba. So Mike went out there and he had a go there and still only got about 1,800 years, I think. So looking a bit desperate at this time. So I said, look, the last one, Bob Edwards was a good old mate and he'd, he'd written an article about the Cleland Hills when he was going out to a place called Adelia to look at some rock engravings and he, the car had got a puncture. So he and Timmy Jugadai Jungarai, uh, a local uh, Aboriginal bloke from House Bluff, had walked in and they'd found a rock shooter with some very ancient looking carvings on it to Bob and a very good potential for Pleistocene. So I gave my copy to Mike. He followed up with, uh, with Bob and went out on a trip there. And then I think uh, there was Graham Walsh on that trip, I remember. And Walsh, he was in, he's only interested in art, nothing else. So we, we went to the wrong site first where I'd, I'd been out on a camel trip out here before. And uh, we better not go into that, but Mike was riding when he was riding along. I, I tried to ride it in the back of a camel. It's rather unusual because you've got this forward moving like that, but it had a lame leg, so it's hitching as well. So it's rather difficult to read my writing in that notebook. Uh, it's rather difficult to read now. But uh, what you had was Mike went out there in this Walshy. We pulled up on the rise at sundown and it was lovely sunset light and desert oaks and Marg, my wife, was there. She's the brains of the family, by the way. And uh, we were sitting up there and... And uh, I said, how do you beat this Walsh? And he said, there's no bloody art, Dick. And that was Walsh's view. If there's no art, there's no sight. So we went on the next day and Mike said, look, we've got to look here. And I said, well, I'll start up this end. And I went up, climbed up Mount Winter, which is the 
southern, uh, sort of southeastern part of the range and walked along, started walking to check things out, knowing it wouldn't be there, but a bit of a chance it might be there. And then Mike came along and he said, look, we've found it, Dick. So I went up there and Mike had actually found the site again. And that was the start of footage. I think that's enough for me, but uh, thanks very much. And uh, best wish to Mike and the family. And it's been lovely to be here. Lovely to see Jim Bowl and, and uh, John Mulvaney, all these very good friends of long times ago, or some more recent too. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we still have a few minutes, actually. I, I think we have ten minutes. Is that right, Peter? Five. Okay. Uh, so, really, if anything has bubbled to the surface in the audience, I, I think we should release it in, into the public domain, uh, a question or a comment, um, not necessarily to any of us, but to uh, responding to any, any of the, the morning's uh, contributions. Mark, <laughs> the floor is yours, Mark. Uh, I just want to say something about that, that fabulous 1996 trip with the, the Matu native title claim. That was really an important time for me. I'd bailed out of an ANU job and I wasn't sure what I was going to do and there was all that sort of personal stress of was I going to be able to stay in archaeology and all, all that sort of stuff. And the invitation to do the fieldwork in the the Western Desert with, with Pete was just very timely. I'd been interviewed for, an, uh, for this National Museum job, but I'd heard nothing. So off we went 5,000 kilometres across country with 20-odd you know, Martu driving this supply wagon. And just a few little moments stand in my mind. We'd, we'd driven this incredible distance cross country, cr cross sand dune after sand dune after sand dune. My co-driver or my, the guy in the, the, the cab with me was um, I think Tommy Watson, a Pinterby guy. He was a bit of a sour character. Every time I made a mistake he would say something like, bloody white fellas, no bloody idea. You know, it wasn't very supportive. And, um, <laughs> and we'd, um, um, I was the last truck in the line and we were just coming into uh, the Calvert Range again, you know, where it was going on dusk, we're getting to the end of a long journey across country, and I got another puncher. And uh, I got out and I had to fix it, and of course Tommy sat and watched me. Uh, <laughs> and that was just one of those, those little moments, you think, why am I out here? <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was another little cameo moment when we came into... Um, um, was in the Percival Lakes and we were desperately short of water and we were using a lot of water with 20 odd people with us and uh, we were really down to our last cupful each and we'd come into, I think it was Kodorawa Well, and we'd come in, uh, which is a uh, little mound spring on the edge of the salt lake and we could see from a distance it had water in it so we thought we're right and we got to it and there was a decomposing camel in it. Uh, <laughs> But someone had the bright idea of pushing a piece of hose pipe down and sucking a bit of water out, and it was fresh at the bottom. So we bailed out the stinking camel, bailed out, uh, uh, scraped out all the smelling mud, and we had to sit there overnight while it refilled with water. And fortunately it did, and we had our water. Now, in all this trip, which was, it was just the most fabulous trip uh, across country, um, we, we didn't have any radio communications. Um, HF radios, our usual way of communicating, were becoming scarce because we're now into the era of satellite telephones. But we couldn't get a satellite telephone. They're a bit expensive for us. And our radio telephone that had been promised hadn't caught up with us. So we'd done this big bush trip without any radio communications. So we went into Port Hedland to resupply. I was really surprised. I mean, by this stage, all my angst about whether I could stay in archaeology had evaporated. I just loved being a bloke driving a flat top tr truck with, with 44s of petrol on the back. I would have been happy driving the salt dozer, bulldozer uh, 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 on, uh, on the Port Hedland salt pile, you know. Uh, I could have just stayed out there and been a bloke. Um, forget archaeology. But anyway, we went into, the, uh, went into the land council offices and there were two phone messages waiting for me. 
there was a very frustrated phone message from the National Museum offering me this job. Couldn't understand why I'd been out of contact. And there was another phone message from Marnik saying, take it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. We're glad you did. <laughs> I'm afraid we've got to wrap up there. Look, can I say thank you to Philip and to his panel? Stay there. I want everyone to clap you because it's happened again. Because... <laughs> can I just point out that everyone on the stage here has come a very long way to be with us here today, and I think that's a, a symbol of the affection in which we all hold Mike. So thank you, Philip. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Anne. Anyway. Okay.